Um, so this presentation is going to be about emerging markets, uh, unknown markets, and data on those markets, and the sort of questions that you want to ask if you're looking to, to go into any of them. So first, uh, let me introduce Superdata. For those of you who don't already know us, Superdata is a New York-based market research firm, and we provide uh, data and insights on the $85 billion global games and entertainment market. Um, we do this by tracking the monthly spending of about 48 million digital gamers across PC, console, and mobile platforms um, in over 40 key, uh, 40 key markets. And so um, I'll also be talking about what we call playable media. And so playable media is essentially anything that uh, indirectly or directly facilitates games. Um, so this is anything like esports or virtual reality or gaming video content that you would watch on YouTube or Twitter, I mean, <laughs> or uh, Twitch. And so we have a uh, subscription service called the Superdata Arcade, and that's where a lot of this data comes from. So um, you can find a lot of that there uh, and even more, including the top performing titles across categories and markets. But enough about the boring stuff, um, or actually a little bit more, just me introducing myself. Um, I am the Director of Research and Insights at Superdata. So my background is both professional and academic in uh, socioeconomics, research, and digital media. And basically what I do is I design our, our research methods. So you'll see a lot of qualitative research in this, and essentially explaining the, the why behind the what, and that's what my department does. So this is uh, a fraction of our team. And so let's begin. Um, the market, as I mentioned, for global games and playable media is $85.1 billion globally. Um, so retail is becoming less and less uh, part of the market. And we're seeing a lot more digital. So you can see digital is completely outpacing retail at this point. And then you have you know, added on to that playable media that, that, is, that uses primarily, if, if not um, always, uh, digital gaming. Maybe not always, um, but for the most part. And so <clears throat> when we delve into the three main categories, so PC, mobile, console, uh, we can see that mobile and PC are kind of neck and neck for first place, right? So um, last year it was PC, this year it's mobile, and we, um, when we say PC, we mean MMOs, both subscription and free-to-play, social and DLC. And so um, we're going to continue to see growth on the PC side, uh, primarily due to free-to-play MMOs and DLC. Uh, and then mobile is starting to stagnate quite a bit. I'm sure you've heard a ton about that at this conference, so I won't go into it too much. Uh, but the total market has increased 4.4%, and uh, we expect it to continue to increase as we see more uh, markets sort of entering gaming and influencing it. And so I want to sort of walk you through as our you know, guide through these different markets the, the life, uh, the life cy cycle stages for a lot of these key segments. And so you have on the y-axis innovative uh, momentum, so whether or not innovation is accelerating or decelerating or if it's kind of staying the same. Um, then you have on the x-axis life cycle, so if it's sort of late in its life cycle and it's kind of winding down, or if it's early and we can kind of expect a lot more acceleration and in innovation. Beginning with physical uh, retail games and subscription-based MMOs, these are the models that are largely kind of almost over. Uh, and that's because we're seeing a lot more of, of consumer agency. Consumers really want to be uh, the decision makers behind what they're paying for. And so retail, you know, you kind of upfront get a game uh, and then potentially you have to keep paying to be able to play that game. Uh, and then subscription, you absolutely do. And so with the 
introduction of free to play games, now, you know, why would you do that when you can try a game out for free and decide for yourself what you want to pay for and how often? So, uh, sort of honing in on some of these key markets that we're seeing growing, um, we're seeing, you know, social is kind of, it's, it's kind of deflating as a lot more players and, uh, and games are moving over to, so, to mobile. And so casino is really dominating social. And game companies may, you know, try out their games, test them out on social, and then port them over to mobile. But the, the sort of um, heyday of social is coming to an end. So <clears throat> we expect to see a decline, and we're starting to really see a decline in, in innovation. And then, kind of um, skipping over mobile for a second, PC DLC, we're seeing a lot more in terms of hardware capability that's facilitating that. So as we continue to see um, more hardware and more software that, that is able to run on PCs, like League of Legends can run on almost anything. Um, and as we continue to see more games like that, as well as PCs that are uh, more capable and priced lower, DLC will certainly rise. <clears throat> sort of the same thing with digital console. It's still in its retail stage, but we're seeing a lot of growth uh, due to the, the new cycle of consoles and their ability to, to download and um, facilitate gameplay. And then as I mentioned, free-to-play MMO, it's, it's not quite in the middle stage of its lifetime. We're seeing a lot of um, great games coming out, but we're, we're starting to see a consolidation, much like we've seen in mobile, where the top games are, um, are really dominating the market. And so uh, we, we kind of expect that to happen, to continue to happen, but we do expect some of those games to to sort of wind down at some point. Um, but it, it could be dependent on esports and, and esports popularity, and I'll go into that a little bit more. And then mobile is still huge, but um, you know, it's it's not really increasing at, at a at a rate that it was before. It's it's sort of um, at least in the global perspective, it, it's sort of uh, stagnant at the moment. But as we see emerging markets like Southeast Asia or a Latin America begin to, to merge into their, uh, their later stages of smartphone penetration and, and mobile gaming, we're going to see that happen a lot faster than we did with developed, um, developed markets. And so in the next few years, we expect to, to see a bump in that growth. But right now, we're just not there yet. And so one way that developers are starting to ease into mobile since it's so competitive and marketing is um, so expensive is through IP and branding. And so there are a lot of brands that recognize the, the potential of mobile, some of them really late, um, but some of them wanting to continue the momentum that they've gathered with a lot of their branding and so they're getting, you know, large studios like EA, but also smaller studios to to bring new life into gaming and and uh, bring a unique perspective to their brand. And so we're we're seeing branding kind of take over uh, in a lot of ways. And so you know, Star Wars is really dominating, and that makes sense with the Star Wars movie coming out and and all of those things. Um, but we're seeing a lot of different branding coming out. And specifically, if you look at social casino games, it's, it's completely full at this point of branding. Most, uh, if not all of the top games, have some kind of branding in it um, from you know old TV shows or what have you. And then we're starting to see celebrities come into the fold. Glue is, is starting to bring in all of these personalities. So the more that we see this kind of recognizable branding, the more we're going to see a lot of uh, players gravitate toward the brands that they've already uh, interacted with and they're already emerged with. So that's, that's a way into the market. But what is complex about that and, and what can be tricky is that so far the owners of the intellectual property manage to keep a lot of that value for themselves. And a lot of these games have very short uh, cycles. So you may get an initial bump 
in revenue and in momentum, but then that may cycle down and you're giving you know, a large percentage of your revenue to the IP holders. In terms of regions, China is, is what everybody wants to know about, right? It's, it's the emerging market that had this enormous boom, but it's saturated. It's, it, there are too many games, especially from outside markets that are coming in. And we're starting to see this growth slow down quite a bit. So um, it's 62% of Asia's total at the present time. Um, but we're only seeing the audience base grow 18% from 2015 to 2018. So people who are playing the games, uh, the mobile games in China, those are pretty much the extent of it. I mean, it's going to be a lot harder to access new players. So forget China. If we start to look at outside emerging markets, so I, I mentioned earlier Southeast Asia. This is an, a market that's really starting to come into its own, but it's still in early stages. And that has advantages and disadvantages, right? So the advantages are you can be uh, first, uh, you know, one of the first players. Uh, India has a really rich potential in respect to mobile growth and their mobile games market. And if you consider how big India is, I mean, it rivals China in terms of population. It will surpass China in terms of population. So once we're getting to a point where um, the population can, the large percentage of the population can afford smartphones, then you're, you know, a lot of publishers are going to be glad that they entered the market sooner than later. So there are some real opportunities and. There are some smaller markets that are very, very rich in their economy, in their uh, smartphone penetration. So you see Singapore, you see Hong Kong. Though they're small, they're great markets to kind of test the waters with. You're going to see good monetization. Um, it's like I, I want to compare it to Chile. So in Latin America, Chile is, is, a, is sort of a completely different breed in, ter in terms of the economy. Um, it's almost a, a first world country and compared to all of the other economies in Latin America, I mean, it, it far surpasses it, but it's tiny. So people don't see opportunity there, which makes a lot of sense. But as these smaller markets are growing, the, the, the uh, conglomeration of all of those markets are going to be great opportunities for developers that don't want to deal with the complexities of a market like China. So moving on to the next uh, part of the life cycle stages, this is what we call playable media. Virtual reality, I'll get into in a second, but to start with, we're looking at esports and gaming video content. And so following the, the physical and digital distribution of games, the industry is really shifting, as I mentioned before, toward user control, ownership, and content creation. So. Players want to be involved with games and playable media. They don't just want to play. They want to be part of its ecosystem. They want to, they want to be a player uh, beyond gameplay. And these are ways in which they're participating and creating an engaged community. But there are some, uh, some tricky, tricky facts to these different markets and, and a lot of pros and cons to keep in mind. So to start with, gaming video content has become such a big part of games that um, you know it, it's really it's really helped the participation of players in the way that I mentioned in terms of agency. But even beyond being able to watch or stream, they're able to communicate in a different way with other gamers. So, for example, with Twitch, you're starting to see streamers give uh, you know give interaction to their fans in a way that you know YouTube doesn't do as well. And so Twitch has become a real powerhouse. And in terms of revenue, Twitch is, is rocking it. Um, because compared to YouTube, YouTube has a, a finite sort of monetization model with their, their ad revenue. But as I mentioned, as you see more of that engagement, as you see more players wanting to be part of that streaming culture, 
Twitch provides multiple ways in which to do that and monetizes. So um, being able to subscribe and get benefits from your subscriptions and being able to, um, to donate to your favorite streamers, that gives a, a way for a lot of uh, players to sort of find new ways that they can, they can engage themselves. Um, but also it, it gives different channels like Twitch, YouTube, and so on, ways that they can participate with the player. And, and seeing this growth on the part of YouTube and Twitch has led the way for a lot of other channels. So we're starting to see specialized channels that are serving niche markets. We're starting to see competition to these channels that actually makes a really great diverse market. Um, but you know, as saturation kind of reaches a high point, we'll start to see consolidation in a lot of ways, and and you know, we'll start to see larger companies, the way that we saw Amazon and Google kind of take over YouTube and Twitch. We'll start to see some of that, um, even maybe on the part of say Twitch or YouTube themselves. So, I want to briefly touch on uh, esports, but it's it's a very I mean, in terms of this topic, I think it's very complex and it's sort of beyond the scope. So, you know, revenue, we're seeing 77% of revenue coming from indirect sources. And by indirect, I mean sponsorships and advertising. The issue with that is now that we're seeing big players dominate esports, so Activision coming into the fold and purchasing MLG and pushing a lot of their games into the front, uh, the front lines of esports, we're seeing visibility on the part of those larger companies that smaller game developers and publishers are not going to have as much of. So what, you know, what I think is really going to be the opportunity for smaller publishers and smaller games is less trying to jump in directly into the, the esports pool and actually trying to build a competitive community on amateur and, and micro tournament sites. So right now they're only, you know, 27.7 million dollars, about 4% of the esports market. But as uh, you know, the, the, the more effective channels start to, to weed out some of the weaker ones, they'll uh, rise above and you'll see a lot of those mid-tier games find their own engagement in, in a very similar way to esports. And so finally, and my favorite topic, is virtual reality. Um, so here we see $661 million for virtual reality in 2015. In the grand scope of things, it's not a lot, but if you consider that that's essentially SDKs, you know, and, and just Oculus selling out of them, that's pretty impressive. Uh, so, and, and also with the Google Cardboard, you have a lot of, uh, you, you have some monetization in that respect as well. And so we see a fifth of US gamers looking forward to VR in a very strong way. Um, it, it, there's an intent to purchase behind it. And 74% of those US gamers are specifically looking to play video games above all other entertainment. So, you know, there, there are other gamers that are looking for a more well-rounded experience, but gamers by and large are looking specifically for that gaming experience in VR. So a quarter of interested gamers say their biggest reservation is that the devices are not going to provide a seamless experience. And I think that, um, that Palmer Lucky kind of summarizes it really well. You kind of have to just try it. A lot of people I don't think are, are trying VR or are able to try VR, but once you do, it's a really formative experience. At least it was for me. Um, I've anticipated VR literally my whole life, and it, it's finally here in a real way. And I think games are going to be the driver for VR um, because you have such, such a strong community in games. They're very active versus passive entertainment uh, fans. And so, you know, gamers will, will sort of lead the march in that respect. So if we look at the whole VR market, uh, the total is $3.2 billion for VR 
specific to gaming. This is not the entire VR market um, outside of that. So this is for this year. We anticipate that uh, you know North America and Europe will be um, pretty much on par. Asia will be lower, and this has a lot to do with the fact that Google Cardboard and, and the likes of Google Cardboard, or, or what we call light mobile devices, are going to be um, the leaders in China. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that they have the opportunity to, to cheaply manufacture um, these light mobile devices. And so they will lead the way in a lot of ways, um, even though they're, they're not monetizing quite as highly as some of these other markets are, there's going to be a lot more volume and um, we're going to see you know, these, these initial steps toward quality, uh, quality content come into the fold in affordable ways so that we can see more and more new consumers trying VR and loving VR. And the interest in pre-orders really shows the potential for the market. I know that you know, we don't necessarily know how many devices uh, Oculus or, or Samsung have, have sold, but they're continuing to sell out. And, I, and that really shows that there's an excitement behind it. So I wanted to show this. This is a little bit outdated. It's from September, but it's really interesting. And the reason why is because this was before pre-orders for, um, for these devices. And there was not a lot of anticipation for Oculus Rift. So this is uh, purchase intent on the part of US gamers, or at least seemingly so, right? So Samsung Gear, Oculus, just about a tenth each of the market. But then we see that that changes really fast. So in 2016, we saw as, as more of, you know, as Oculus and Gear started to present more demos and started to be in the media more, we see a lot more interest. And that really shows sort of the acceleration that we are likely to see in the VR market um, over the next couple of years. So I mentioned light mobile VR. We have, uh, those are your Google Cardboards or, or anything that's, that's like that. You do need supporting software. So that is something that um, is somewhat of a barrier for a lot of markets. Smartphones are, are fairly prevalent. So, you know, we will see Light Mobile and we have seen Light Mobile become very popular. But in terms of premium mobile, it's not quite its time yet. Uh, specifically because we have uh, devices that are geared toward one specific brand of smartphones, like the Samsung Gear, and um, it's not quite as universal in, in terms of, of key markets, let alone emerging markets. And then you have the, the obvious players, PC VR, so the Vive, uh, Oculus Rift, and then you have console VR. And what's interesting about console VR is that it, it doesn't have uh, quite the install base, not even close, um, as to uh, Oculus or, or, Sam or light mobile devices. But console gamers are really excited. PlayStation gamers have shown a real excitement. And you know, sort of going back to this, already there was a huge purchase intent back in September for PlayStation. So we are seeing that 35 uh, million install base start to, to come in and say, you know, how interested they are. And what's, what's great about it is that you have a console which is affordable, and I mean, in respect to, uh, you know, the gaming PC that can take on the Oculus. And so if you already have a PlayStation, it's plug and play. It's really easy. It's just like mobile. And we've seen a lot of growth. We've seen a lot of momentum behind mobile. We're going to see that a lot too with console. And as PC becomes cheaper, uh, we're also going to see that with PC. And as it becomes more capable with different devices. So if we look at it by platform, it, you know, 2015 is kind of old news, right? It was, it was very early on. There wasn't a lot coming in. But 2016, we see you know, a $3 billion market for games really uh, sort of starting to come into its own. And we see an exponential growth. So over the years, as we see more and more players and consumers 
coming in and trying VR and enjoying VR and more VR devices becoming available and competitive, we're going to see a very quick increase in VR. So we anticipate that by 2019, it'll already be an $11 billion market just in respect to uh, games in terms of software, hardware, and peripherals. And so to quote Palmer Lucky once again, um, you know, it's just a matter of time before VR becomes mainstream, and it will uh, when VR headsets drop under $100 like smartphones today. And so we sort of anticipate that happening in the next uh, three, four, five years. And the thing is, as a developer, the trick is not to port your game. There are developers that, that are like, you know, VR is really cool. I want to be part of that. I already have a game, so I'm going to make it immersive. And I, I, that's not the correct approach. What's so fantastic about VR is it's, it's a new medium. It's not a new genre. It's not a new platform. It is like the smartphone. It is like the TV. It is going to, to be... Um, transformative of what we know about media. And so you want to make a game for VR. You want to make something that is going to capture your, your player base in a way that no other medium can. And so that's the challenge, but that's also the opportunity. So some key takeaways. Mobile and PC are neck and neck for first place. They're hovering near $30 billion. Um, we're seeing a uh, decline in retail subscription and social games. They're a combined 28% of interactive entertainment, but they will continue to lose market share because of the desire for gamers to sort of control and have some control over the way that they're paying for games or not paying for games. You know, they're exclusively, many, many exclusively free to play players, and so they've, they've sort of dominated. Mobile has consolidated, and we're going to see that essentially in most markets. We're seeing that now with esports. We're seeing large companies sort of take over smaller companies, um, and we're going. We're, we're in mobile. You have the top ten companies making eighty-five percent of the revenue of the mobile market, and over a million games in the mobile gaming space. So. It's a difficult place to enter into if you're not already there and have support. Don't go to China. Um, unless you know a partner that you trust, unless you understand the market, unless you are ready to potentially fail. Um, not saying you will, just saying that it happens a lot. And if you have an expectation that your game is going to come in and, and be gangbusters like Clash of Clans. It might happen, but it very well may not. So another way to tap into new markets is something like Southeast Asia. We're seeing a $1 billion mobile games market right now that has the, a great potential to grow. Find out where your players go to watch um, and, and use gaming video content to uh, enhance your discoverability. Use it in creative ways to engage with players. But remember that they're going to see if you're overtly marketing at them. So don't, don't market at them. Engage with them, talk to them. Use gaming video content as a way to make them feel like they're part of, they're part of the spirit of your game and your game company. And almost as if you know, you, you're speaking directly to them. Esports is a small global market. It's just $750 million when you compare it to an $85 billion games uh, and interactive entertainment market that's less than 1%. Um, it's already largely dominated by top players, so you might not want to build an esports specifically. You might want to make your game um, esports friendly, but your, but your best bet is going to build a community inside of uh, amateur tournament sites. And finally, virtual reality is not a peripheral, it's a medium. 
So don't just port a game to VR and don't discount it. Make a game that's specifically going to give an enhanced experience on VR and tap into this year's 3.2 billion market before we start seeing the Activisions and EAs come in and sort of swallow it. Um, so you have a greater understanding and you're able to, to grow with the market as opposed to try to enter later on in the life cycle. So that is my presentation. Does anyone have questions? Uh, amazing talk. Um, you were talking about don't do overt marketing to uh, live streamers or to, can you kind of, I mean, I guess there's a lot of people here who do marketing and, and are interested in what would be a good, how can you go about marketing to people without marketing to people in those channels? Can you give us a little bit more insight on, on what, what you're trying to suggest they don't do or do? Sure. So it's a lot like social media um, in a sense. If you are following a brand on Twitter and they are, are pushing their brand on you in, in, a, um, in, an, in a, a way that, that shows that they're marketing at you, um, you're going to trust them a lot less. You're not going to want to engage with them. And it's going to essentially drive you away because consumers expect marketing in certain places. And sure, they expect it on YouTube via commercials, but watching a video that's overtly trying to sell you something, you have the choice to, to skip it. And you're gonna, because look at Netflix, look at Hulu Plus, um, look at these different you know channels that are coming about that are offering a commercial free experience. People don't want a commercial. They want, they want a way to interact with brands that they love. And so by building content that, um, you know, sort of is, is, is related to your own content, but is not, hey, go, go buy this, or look at this fantastic virtual item that we've just come out with. And it's more, this is how our game is played. Um, this is what fans want. We're listening to you. Comment below. We'll read it. We'll respond. That's the kind of conversation that you want to have. So as I mentioned, with social media, you see it a lot too. And you want to see an organic growth and participation. Um, that's not going to come from advertising after they see an advertisement. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. That's really interesting. I was thinking for... Oh, there's a mic. Oh. Uh, like the change you uh, mentioned, like virtual reality or uh, uh, YouTube and Twitch channels, how do you think uh, in terms of uh, casual games, like small mobile games, is it going to have the same potential with those uh, new tools and innovations? Oh, absolutely. I mean, YouTube and Twitch already, the casual games already have a presence on, on streaming and video content sites. And virtual reality is just, you know, starting in its initial stages with mobile. But there's a lot of really creative content on virtual reality right now that's only really interesting if it's, if it's in virtual reality. And it is casual. Some of it is very casual. But there's this potential for hardcore and casual games on mobile that's, um, that's sort of unique. And so if you're, if you're building a game that's specifically addressing the capabilities and the opportunities in VR and it's casual, there's absolutely going to be a market. You know, eventually you're going to have, um, instead of opting into watching TV, you're going to have, say, a social casino player, um, you know, maybe a few years down the line, say, I don't, I don't want to watch TV, I want to feel like I'm in a casino. Um, so there's definitely a place for casual games. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much. If you do have questions, um, you can contact me at stephanie at superdataresearch.com. You can come up here and we can talk. Thank you so much.